Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first quarter 2019 Tile Shop Holdings Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will follow at that time. If anyone should require operator assistance, please press the star then the zero key on your touchtone telephone. As a reminder, this call will be recorded. I would now like to introduce your host for today's conference, Mr. Ken Cooper with Investor Relations. You may begin. Thank you, Catherine. Good morning to everyone on the call, and welcome to the Tile Shop's first quarter earnings call. Joining me on today's call are Cabby Loma, our Chief Executive Officer, and Kirk Gettleman, our Chief Financial Officer. Following our prepared remarks, the call will be open for analyst questions. Certain statements made during the call today constitute forward-looking statements made pursuant to and within the meaning of the Safe Harbor Provisions of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995 as amended. Such forward-looking statements are subject to both known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from such statements. Those risks and uncertainties are described in our earnings press release issued earlier and in our filings with the SEC. The forward-looking statements made today are as of the date of this call, and we do not undertake any obligation to update these forward-looking statements. Today's call will also include certain non-GAAP measurements. Please see our earnings release for reconciliation of those non-GAAP financial measures. With that, let me turn the call over to Cabby. Cabby? Thanks, Ken, and good morning, everyone. While we continue to make good progress during the first quarter on many of our strategic initiatives, this progress was overshadowed by continued weakness in traffic trends in the quarter. During the quarter, we were able to complete all of the unfinished work outstanding for our 2018 strategic initiatives. We also went live with two new systems in January, including our new ERP system on January 1 and our new website platform in mid-January. We believe this ERP upgrade gives us the ability to expand our business nationwide over the next 10 years and target 400 stores as our long-term opportunity. I could not be more proud of our store teams, our distribution center teams, and our team here in the Plymouth, Minnesota office for how they handle these significant system upgrades. New systems do typically present some unique challenges, and in our case, this had a negative impact on our traffic, customer experience, and sales during the quarter. Initially, we experienced issues with our POS system functionality immediately after conversion on January 1. While most of these issues were fixed in January, we began to encounter some additional problems, particularly with system speed and performance, as our business picked up seasonally. This impacted our customer checkout times, in certain cases by a factor of up to two times longer. Our pro customers, many of whom frequent our stores multiple times per week, are generally accustomed to a relatively quick checkout process. Unfortunately, in some cases during the first quarter, we did not meet our pro's expectation for checkout speed, which we believe temporarily reduced their frequency of visits to our stores. Our retail customer experience was negatively impacted as well, particularly in January, immediately after conversion. This poor customer experience was reflected in our net promoter scores in January. After reaching all-time highs in NPS during the fourth quarter of 2018, our scores dipped in January, primarily due to challenges with new systems. Subsequent to January, we saw our NPS scores bounce back, and by March, our NPS results were back close to the high levels we expect. Our action item here is continued performance tuning of our POS system. We've made some good improvements to date, and we are currently testing some additional enhancements that we hope to have in place in all stores in early May. As we look forward to the remainder of 2019, our strategy will continue to be to deliver the best assortment, the best presentation, and the best service in our industry. Our product assortment initiative is now complete, but it will remain our top priority as it is one of our key points of differentiation from competitors. Our overall sales for the 2,500 new products we've introduced over the last 15 months continue to climb with total sales for these products now representing a significant portion of our overall sales mix. Our results for the stone category continue to improve as well. As a reminder, average selling prices for stone are typically about two times the ASPs for man-made products, so this should continue to provide nice support to our average ticket growth. Finally, we're very excited about the man-made ceramic and glass color collections we've recently introduced. The last group of these new SKUs just arrived in the last few weeks, and we expect them to be all in our stores by the end of May. We're confident that no other competitor can come close to offering the choices that we now have available to present to our retail customer, her designer, and our other key pro channel partners who often serve as key influencers for our retail customers. Let me now turn to traffic. 
Getting traffic back to our historical levels for both pro and retail customers will continue to be one of our top priorities. Weak traffic during the quarter was driven by three factors. The first factor was our new website platform and ERP systems. We estimate conversion to these new systems accounted for approximately one-third of our traffic decline during the quarter. Second, we estimate poor weather accounted for approximately one-third of our overall traffic decline during the quarter as it caused delays in the completion of customer projects. When we looked at our comp performance by geography, it was very clear where weather had an impact. The past few quarters, our performance nationwide was fairly consistent. This was not the case in the first quarter. In fact, our southern store markets generally delivered positive comp sales growth, with many in the double-digit positive range, while our Midwest and Northeast store markets generally delivered negative comp sales growth during the quarter. Another important data point is that our open sales order balance at the end of March was approximately 20% higher than last year. We are an order business, not a transactional business like some of our other competitors. So our sales results are a function not only of open orders created, but also of how many of these orders we are able to close and deliver. Many of our pro customers simply hadn't been ready to pick up their orders yet due to project delays caused by unseasonal weather. If our open order balance would have been more in line with normal levels at the end of March, we would have ended up much closer to our estimated sales range for the first quarter. Our action item here is to proactively schedule pickup or delivery for outstanding sales orders and coordinate with these pros to ensure that they know their tile and installation materials are ready to go. It's important to note that we don't have a formal policy forcing pro customers to pick up within a specified time duration. It's a value proposition that our customers really appreciate, and this is a great example of our industry-leading customer service. The third factor was our decision not to reallocate approximately $1 million in traditional media that we spent last year. We felt with so much going on in our stores with final product assortment still arriving, store re-merchandising, and new fixtures being completed and system upgrades occurring, that to put those media dollars into play would not have delivered the return we expect. We are considering using these dollars through the, the remainder of 2019. In addition, our recent retail brand marketing efforts have been dedicated primarily to higher-end and premium brand building initiatives, such as new product catalogs and ads in high-end design magazines. This work has been very content-intensive and took some time to implement as we had to internally develop all the exclusive content required to enable this strategy. We intend to continue this work as we believe our core retail customer typically takes extensive time to carefully research her project, because her investment is greater and she views it as something that will last for decades. At the same time, we believe we can supplement this work with the addition of retail marketing targeted to customers with slightly lower household income. This is based upon some recent analysis we completed using our new CRM tools, which have provided us with greater insight on our retail customer segmentation, as well as recent traffic and sales trends for these customer segments. Now keep in mind, this data did not exist prior to last year's investment. Based upon this data, we are in the process of adjusting our media mix accordingly. Perhaps most importantly, we believe our new CRM tools have helped confirm great product selection and excellent service are the top two most important value considerations for our core retail customers. We believe with all the investments we've recently made in product and service, we are very well positioned to appeal to a wide range of pro and retail customers. Over the next several quarters, we intend to invest more in various forms of marketing to drive more immediate results and drive better retail customer traffic. Kirk will discuss some of the implications of these investments and how we intend to fund this marketing expense in a few minutes. Our third top priority continues to be ensuring we have the best product presentation in our stores and on our website. During the first quarter, we installed extensive new merchandise fixtures in 64 stores. This work will be 100% complete with all stores having the new fixtures by mid-May. At that point, we can finally say we're fully showcasing all 2,500 new products that have recently entered our assortment. We've seen some good improvement in customer conversion, and we believe the investments we've made in merchandising have certainly contributed to these improved conversion results. Finally, our new website platform now does a great job of presenting our product in a more effective and efficient manner making the research and overall shopping experience for our customers much easier and more fun. The images and content on our website are powerful and very consistent with our in-store signage and our brand marketing messaging. 
Our ultimate objective is to inspire our customers through a seamless experience, whether she is opening one of our new product catalogs, researching her project on our website, or shopping in one of our stores. Our fourth top priority is service. During 2018, we made substantial investments in both store and distribution center compensation, regional sales leadership, and new pro market managers. Our primary goal in 2019 is to fully leverage all these investments and generate return. I continue to work closely with our operations team to focus on sales excellence, increased traffic, and improved conversion. As I mentioned, we are seeing some good improvement in conversion, and we will work hard to ensure that continues. Our fifth top priority is store unit growth. Our current expectation is that the majority of our new store openings over the next two to three years will continue to be in existing markets. Our regional sales leaders, training support team, and store talent pipeline have us well positioned. We finalized our real estate plans for the year and now expect to open six stores, one of which is a relocation. So we expect to end the year with 145 stores. Our focus is now on 2020 and beyond. I'll now turn the call over to Kirk, who will take you through some of the financial details. Kirk? Thanks, Gabby. Good morning, everyone. As Kathy mentioned, weak traffic trends were the primary reason for our comp sales decline of 4.2%. Generating positive comp store sales growth is critical for us to achieve our plans for 2019, as well as begin to make some progress on our long-term objectives of 20% adjusted EBITDA margin and 20% return on capital employed. We remain optimistic that we are on the right path. Although we fell short of our comp sales expectations during the quarter, we believe we are well positioned for this to bounce back relatively quickly. As Kevin mentioned, it was an extremely busy quarter with several significant company initiatives either being implemented or wrapping up. This was combined with weather factors that affected our ability to close out orders. We feel like we're close to hitting our stride and having a stable business as it relates to things we can control. Nearly all of our new product is now in our stores. Our stores are looking great with the new merchandising fixtures, signage, and end caps. And we appear to be past the toughest parts of each of our system upgrades. Finally, we have a strong sales team who are laser focused on providing excellent customer service and converting sales. We believe the winning formula for mid-single-digit comp sales will be growing our pro traffic and sales, growing our retail traffic and sales with our more affluent customer who's doing a large size project, and growing our retail traffic and sales for moderately affluent customers doing a mid-size project. From an industry perspective, mid-size projects and large-size projects make up approximately 70% of sales and 85% of the total annual industry profit. This is our sweet spot. Small projects comprise 30% of industry sales and 15% of total industry profit. We will continue to serve this group as well. Our 6,000 tile SKU assortment, which now covers the entire spectrum of good, better, best options positions us to deliver for all types of customers and project sizes. I'd now like to provide a brief overview of our first quarter financial performance and update our current outlook for 2019. Net sales of $86.9 million were down 4.6% year over year. Comparable store sales decreased 4.2% in the quarter, driven by weak traffic. As Kathy mentioned, we generally experienced much better sales results in our southern store markets. These markets were less impacted by poor weather conditions. Gross profit was $61.8 million for the first quarter of 2019, a 3.3% decrease over the same quarter of last year. Gross margin of 71.2% continued to increase sequentially. The year-over-year improvement of approximately 90 basis points from the first quarter of last year 
was primarily the result of higher pricing on new products that have entered the assortment. We expect to deliver a gross margin rate in the 70% range going forward. Our selling general and administrative costs for the quarter were $58.9 million. Depreciation expense increased $1 million from the first quarter of 2018. First quarter SG&A expense also included approximately $2.5 million of extra expense related to the implementation of our new enterprise resource planning system. These expenses were mostly offset by a $0.8 million reduction in advertising expense and $1.6 million in lower variable expenses, including shipping and transportation costs. We concluded the quarter with 140 stores. In January, we closed one store in Kansas City that was at the end of its lease, and we opened one store in Chantilly, Virginia. Adjusted EBITDA was $11.6 million in the first quarter. Adjusted EBITDA margin was 13.4 percent, a 170 basis point decline compared to last year during the first quarter. Net income for the first quarter was $1.3 million, and earnings per share was three cents. Turning to our balance sheet, we ended the quarter with $7.9 million of cash and $50 million of long-term debt. Our debt decreased approximately $3 million from the fourth quarter due to improved operating cash flow. Inventory of $110.8 million increased by approximately $0.7 million from the fourth quarter, or 0.6%. We expect inventory levels will begin to normalize as we move through 2019. We have a nice opportunity to leverage some of the new tools available with our new ERP system. These tools will enable us to better optimize our inventory levels and receipts flow, communicate more effectively with key suppliers, and reduce our inventory investment while maintaining an industry-leading assortment and good in-stock levels. Capital expenditures were approximately $12.2 million during the first quarter, primarily related to store merchandising, new store opening, and technology investments. We expect our level of capital investment to moderate for the remainder of 2019, as we continue to expect approximately $25 million in CapEx for the year. In addition to a normalization of inventory and capital spending levels, we also believe we have the opportunity to reduce our SG&A slightly below the current run rate, while we work to improve our traffic trends. Based upon some activities we've been working on over the last nine months, including our in-house trucking strategy, we have identified some good G&A savings opportunities that we plan to execute over the remainder of 2019. A portion of these savings will enable us to make the additional investments in retail marketing initiatives that Cabby just mentioned, with the primary goal of improving retail customer traffic. We believe our current pro-customer marketing strategy is very sound based upon our 2018 results and sequential improvement in pro sales we experienced over the course of last year. Our new CRM tools will help us ensure this additional retail customer investment is targeted, and we believe we should be able to generate a good return in the near term. One last update regarding our ERP upgrade. While we are still completing our assessment on the effectiveness of our internal controls over financial reporting as of March 31, 2019, we expect to report two material weaknesses in internal controls over financial reporting arising from the ERP implementation on January 1. We also expect the remediation of the material weaknesses will be completed prior to the end of fiscal 2019. Moving to our long-term outlook. Our internal long-term target for comps continues to be mid-single-digit sales growth. If we are able to sustain sales growth at those levels, we believe we will achieve our ROCE and adjusted EBITDA margin goals within the next several years. Over the last 12 months, we believe we've made all of the necessary strategic expense, 
inventory, and capital investments that we needed to be highly competitive and to serve our pro and retail customers at a very high level. Finally, our board has authorized a $15 million share repurchase program. We believe the combination of a share repurchase program and the dividend we established a few years ago will provide us with a nice set of tools to help us maximize shareholder return over the remainder of 2019 and beyond. With that information, Catherine, we are now ready to take questions. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> if you have a question at this time, please press the star, then the one key on your touchtone telephone. Again, to ask a question, press the star, then the one key on your touchtone telephone. And our first question comes from Jeff Small with City. Your line is open. Hello, Jeff. Good morning. Move past the uh, European website issues. Um, so you mentioned in the prepared remarks today those were a persistent headwind through the quarter. Um, can you help us understand how traffic evolved through the first quarter, what you're now seeing early in the second quarter, and uh, what gives you confidence that trends will, in fact, improve through the year? Hey, Jeff, this is Cabby. I missed the first part of your question. There must have been a mute issue there, but uh, I caught the, the second half. And talking about traffic after our ERP implementation, yes, when we first launched it, that was the most significant impact we saw um, through January. It was a battle with weather and, and uh, the ERP implementation. Now, we did see traffic improve sequentially through, the, through Q1 into February and into March. Um, we're happy with the trend that we're seeing in traffic as our systems continue to be uh, improved day by day. So we're, uh, we're confident where it's going and uh, what we're going to see in Q2. I think the only other thing I'd add, Jeff, uh, good morning, is that uh, it, it's still generally pretty weak, though. Um, you know, while we're, we're, we think we're past the biggest challenges, as Kathy just said, with the systems in January, our, our, our Biggest opportunity here is to first reaccelerate the frequency of our visits with our pro customers. We felt that throughout last year, between Q2, Q3, and Q4, we really saw some nice progress with pro sales growth and pro traffic. And, and it decelerated in Q1 due to some of the challenges that you know we talked about in our opening remarks and also in Gabby's comments here. So the first order of business is to increase the frequency with our pros, and that's where the, you know, we're still not happy with the system speed and performance. We're still doing some additional work, as Caddy said, and, and that goes hand in hand with reaccelerating that, that pro traffic. Understood. That's helpful. Um, and regarding the share buyback authorization, can you help us understand that decision, why that's the right use of cash? rather than get pay down or capital preservation uh, in light of the sales challenges you're seeing? Well, I th you know, we think we have a very good strategy in place, and, and we certainly have done a tremendous amount of work over the last 15 months. We sort of feel like we've done several years' worth of work in, a, in about a year time frame, and we're, you know, we're confident that these things will pay off over the long term, so we feel like uh, we might have a good investment opportunity here with the share repurchase program. Understood. Thanks again, guys, and uh, best of luck in the second quarter. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next question comes from Daniel Moore with CJS Securities. Your line is open. Good morning. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, maybe just talk, Kirk, about, uh, and Cabby, a, a little bit about your ability and confidence to evaluate and measure um, the, the the returns and effectiveness of, of all of the um, you know store refurbishments and, and and more specifically the the new SKUs given the ERP implementation challenges. I guess as you look out over the next six twelve months, you know, tell, what's your confidence that you're going to be able to to know what's working, what isn't, what's you know ERP, what's weather, et cetera, et cetera. Good morning, Daniel. Yes, um, we monitor. 
pretty much everything, especially when it comes to this, the new SKU counts in our stores and, and how they perform. And we've been uh, pretty excited with how the new SKUs are adding to our, our sales mix month in and month out. As we continue to give uh, some tenure to these SKUs, we see them improving. So when we monitor the new SKU count, it gives us the ability to, to change direction on what customers are after um, and how the, the trends are changing. Uh, when it comes to remodels and updating of stores, especially with the re-merchandising that we've put in all the stores, we see conversion going up, and that's something that we can tell is, is working for our customers. They can come in and see all of the SKUs at one time and, and really see that the tile shop is the place to go when it comes to assortment. So we're pretty excited when we see the results. Once those pop-ins hit the stores, you can see the immediate impact. Okay. And can you give any specificity in terms of the, you know, the issues and challenges with regard to checkout times um, and, and, you know, metrics around those? How much did they increase? Um, how much does that come back down now that some of these issues have been handled and when do we get back to normal? I think the the best way to measure that, uh, Dan, is is you know is in terms of the the time for checkout for pros and and Cabby indicated that in his his opening remarks. I mean, if 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 we have a retail customer that we're checking out, and, and typically it's a you know it's a pretty complex transaction, whether it's a retail customer or a pro. But if if she's working with one of our sales and design staff, and she might have you know. 15, 20, 25 lines on her order. She's been into the store several times. She's probably spent, you know, six, seven hours, you know, uh, working with some of our people. So when she's at checkout and she's ready to do the, the, the main part of her purchase transaction, and she's probably not picking it up at that time. It's, that's probably a later time. Her pro will probably pick that up for her or maybe her husband. But if it's a little longer for her, she doesn't really notice it too much. Um, you know, and we did see a dip in January for sure. In January, even our retail customers, you know, were frustrated at times with some of the system stuff going on. But it improved, you know, throughout the quarter. And so retail customers, by the time we got to the end of the quarter, uh, they, we were sort of back to normal from a retail customer satisfaction perspective. But our pros know. Our pros are in the stores, you know, three, five, ten times a week sometimes. And and they have a, they're, you know, they're a little frustrated when it takes them longer. And so, you know, while we don't think that we certainly didn't lose any pros permanently due to new systems, their frequency went down a little bit in the quarter, and we can understand that. We got to work to get our system speed, you know, back back down or you know back up to, to normal high levels of speed, and then we think that frequency will increase. And on top of that, Daniel, we monitor we monitor our MPS scores, and we saw that as in January was the biggest impact. Now we worked feverishly through February and March to add enhancements to pick up the speed for our customers, and we saw that feedback. And we're continuing to tune the system to get more and more speed. And uh, so we we saw where it went, and then where it is now. And as I mentioned in my comments of MPS scores and how they came right back to where we were in Q4. We believe we're close. Um, like I said, there's still work to do. Okay. And, and um, any, I guess, obviously not going to give granularity in terms of, of, of time, but um, where we are in the process of, of uh, getting those feeds back to normal? Is that a, you know, are, are we back to normal by the end of Q2? Is it a longer-term issue? Just help us understand that. We, we've tested some things here in a few stores over the last week. Uh, we're going to test a market here in the next week, and if everything goes according to plan, we should have uh, all stores up and running with a little bit of, uh, you know, not a little bit, hopefully a lot of speed improvement um, by mid-May. That's our goal. Helpful. And lastly for me, and I'll jump back in, mid-single-digit comps is still the goal, obviously. Um, you know, is that something that's realistic in Q2, and if not, what time frame is reasonable given comps, you know, are more normal and, and maybe not as easy as we look to the back half of the year? I don't want to get into any specifics by quarter, but we we still feel that, you know, we're well positioned to have a, a solid year the rest of the year. Um, obviously, weather's got to improve here, uh, and and systems have been improving, and we're, you know, we feel like we're, 
we're, we're close to being back to where we want to be with that. I'll jump back in. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. And our next question comes from Joseph Feldman with Belsey. Your line is open. Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for taking the questions. Um, wanted to just to follow up again. So I, I understand the comments on the traffic. Um, you know, still not quite where you'd like it to be. But just to be clear, I guess what what changed from you know mid February when you guys had the the reported fourth quarter and you guys had indicated that the trends had improved, you know, even the net promoter scores were even picking up at that point. Um, and yet, and, and I think we, at that time we were targeting more like that low single digit comp. It, did something change in the second half of the quarter then that, and, and, and are comps actually back to positive right now in April? Hey Joseph, this is Cabby. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, it was, in, when we did our Q4 earnings call, we had overcome a lot of big hurdles when we first launched our ERP, and we, we felt that things were getting back to normal. But as the, these ERP things unwind, you, you run into new new issues and some lingering ones that what happened as our, as our business increased season, seasonally, I mean, we, we get really busy in February, March, the system speed really, really hurt us, you know, I believe. and. And I think that was after our, our Q4 call, and so we, we found some new issues that were impacting. And then on top of that, weather did not improve in the Midwest and Northeast, so we continued to battle store closures and uh, the system speed. So where we were at that call and what we've you know figured out the next few months, it was it was all new to us. Yeah, and Joe, the only thing I would add is, if if we only would have just had our order bank back to normal levels. Caddy mentioned in his opening remarks that it was about 20% higher from the prior year. If it would have been in line with historical levels, we would have been very close to our estimated range for the quarter. Got it. That, that, that's helpful. Thanks, guys. And then if I could just follow up with one other one. Uh, um, with, just to, on the SG&A, I wanted to better understand, you guys um, – I understand the ERP expenses and the web, web platforming, all the expense related to that, and you also had that offset of, um, you know, the million-dollar reduction in ad spending. I guess how should we think about it going forward? Because I think is there still some ERP expenses that we'll we'll see in second and third quarters here, or is that all just kind of behind us at this point? You know, it's certainly possible, Joe. And I, I think the, the G&A savings that, that I talked about, our intention is that that savings will fund any additional marketing investment that we feel like we can get a good return on, particularly with mid-sized project retail customers. That's really our target. That's where we need the most improvement. And then also it, it will fund any additional ERP expenses that are necessary because our main goal is is getting our traffic back to you know good levels and both the the marketing investment as well as any additional necessary investment in in systems are both important for that. Good. And then if I could just sneak one more in, any any comment additional comment you can make about the material weakness? I, I know that what you said in the prepared remarks and in the press release, but I guess what you know, how did that occur in the first place, you know, where you guys had those two issues come up, you know? Um, is there anything that you, you, I guess, could have done differently? And it sounds like you'll have it kind of remediated quite soon, but just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, nothing nothing really additional to add. I mean, I, you know, just things didn't go exactly as planned, and we have some things to improve from a control perspective, um, you know, in – in the last month or two, we did some additional work working with our auditors to get comfortable with our numbers, and hopefully we'll have the, the control uh, improvements in place relatively soon. That's our goal. Okay. Thanks, guys. Good luck with this quarter. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Justin Kleber with Baird. Your line is open. Hey, guys. It's Justin Kleber. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Wanted to first ask about uh, just pricing online. It's been about a year since you know you made the decision to remove pricing on the site. Looking back, is that 
you think that's been the right strategy or any of these traffic, you know, store traffic challenges, you know, related to pulling price from the website? Uh, you know, maybe just provide any feedback you've gotten, you know, from customers uh, on that decision. Hey, Justin, this is Cabby. Good question. Uh, the answer is uh, absolutely the right decision to pull pricing. Uh, our customer, our targeted core customer, uh, is is someone who is more uh, aspirational who's going to come to our stores. And we feel that we've done very well targeting that core customer and the metrics that we see. Uh, when you when you look at how people are driven to our stores, it's, it's by our pro customer uh, mainly. And then we also work on driving people through our website, obviously, but they're going there to get inspiration. And the people that were there looking for pricing, that's who we targeted a few years back with all of our price promotions. And we realized quickly that was not our strategy. So, no, I believe it was the right decision to pull pricing off the website. Okay. Uh, thanks for that, Cabby. Uh, Kirk, you, you mentioned again just in, in the Q&A the, the order balance being up 20% at the end of the quarter. I guess where does that typically sit at quarter end? Can you help us out there? Just trying to – get a sense as to what the recognition of that revenue, you know, could potentially mean for the second quarter. Yeah, it was it was definitely heightened. I don't want to give a specific number, Justin, but um, as I said, if, if we would have had that in line with normal levels, we would have been pretty close to our original estimated range for the quarter that we gave back, you know, 60 days ago. And, um and, and, you know, we think that largely is weather-related. As, as we're looking at, you know, Cabby gave some pretty good color on sales results by geography. And it was really kind of the, the most notable differential between geographical markets that, that we've seen um, as we've looked at our quarterly results over the last four or five years. And, and that goes for the open order balances as well. We had higher certainly higher year-over-year order balances by market in the Northeast and the upper Midwest. And, uh, you know, I mean, it is what it is. If, if pro projects are delayed, we're not going to force them to pick their stuff up. Um, you know, we can proactively work with them and try to coordinate scheduling and pick up and things like that. But, um, you know, sometimes uh, our pros just aren't ready uh, to pick it up, and I think that, that was part of it. Okay, no, that that makes uh, makes sense. Last question I had just on the the transportation uh, cost decline that you called out, um, you know, related to the the new outbound trucking strategy uh, that, that you implemented last year. Is that something that you're you're doing uh, in all markets? Um, is it a test? Uh, can you just maybe provide a little bit more color on on what's going on with that? Thank you. Yes, yeah, sure, Justin, I can do that. Um, it's not in all markets, but our biggest uh, markets and our biggest DCs are where we deployed that. And, and generally, those markets are also busier from a, uh, a demand perspective. And going back to early last year, we were not only seeing increased costs uh, for, for shipments between our DCs and stores primarily, like many retailers have talked about over the last year in particular, but we were also, unfortunately, experiencing some, some drop shipments as well. And, you know, while trying to search for the best and most efficient route and provider for that route, uh, certain providers were getting bids that were significantly higher, and at the last minute we would lose that service, and it would, re it would result in some customer disappoints. Um, so it was both a, a customer service opportunity to take some of this activity in-house, but it was also a cost uh, savings opportunity as well. And we started talking about it, I think, back in maybe even Q3, but for sure in Q4. And Q4 is really when we started to see a little bit of benefit. And then, uh, you know, obviously here in Q1, we saw some good benefit as well. So we, we feel like we should be able to see that continue. Okay. Uh, thanks, guys. Best of luck going forward. Thank you. And our next question comes from John Ball with Stiefel. Your line is open. Thanks. Uh, good morning. And I apologize I joined late, so if you've answered these, again, apologies. But did you address gross margin outlook for the year? Um, 
And um, are there any tariff uh, implications um, embedded in your inventory um, or your, your outlook? Good morning, John. Um, we did. We, um, uh, in my comments, I articulated that we expect approximately 70% gross margins going forward. We feel good about our, our sourcing strategy that we've been working on. We feel very good about our inventory position. Um, and, and we've, you know, we've been doing some price changes here and there as well. So, um, we continue to feel good about that 70%. Um, and we don't believe that tariffs will have a, you know, a, a very big impact for us going forward. We think we're well positioned. Okay. And, um, again, apologize if you addressed it, but when you look at, um, Q1 and or April trends, is there a way to, I don't know, separate, you know, the weather issues, um, which, you know, could be the cold stuff we had in the Midwest. I don't know, maybe there's some tough comparisons still in Texas with hurricanes. Um, obviously, you had ERP um, challenges, so there's an impact there. And then, um, you know, the what from what you think the overall consumer is doing, certainly it sounds to us like the consumer was very weak in January and February, but has has picked up subsequently to that. Is there any way to discern or break apart those, or is it just too cloudy because of your ERP challenges? John, there is so many variables in play this quarter. I, I can't imagine any more um, that we could have experienced, but we did try to quantify it as best we could. And, and again, I to boil it down to very simple terms. I think the impacts were largely on traffic. So let's just start with that being the primary, primary opportunity we had going forward. Um, and to the extent that our, you know, our traffic was negative year over year, we're not going to offer a specific number necessarily, but that's the main uh, factor. Um, about a third of the traffic decline, um, to the best of our ability, we estimate was weather. About a third of the t traffic decline, we estimate, was new systems. And then the rest, I think, is just customer mix changing and, you know, as you said, some softness potentially in consumer spending. And, you know, on that piece, we really need to just get after certain retail customer segments and do a little bit different, you know, strategy to make sure we, we get our share of their traffic. And that's what we tried to explain in some of, in some of Cabby's remarks. And is there any way on the co uh, competitor front, I'm thinking particularly at Depot and Lowe's, it seems to be in a little bit of a slugfest um, in flooring, um, along with floor and decor, um, of how you're seeing that uh, uh, behavior? You mentioned your pro business was weak even since your ERP has improved. It's still not the traffic you want to see on pro. Is that self-inflicted totally, and do you think that will recover, or do you think there's some kind of spillover from the ongoing battles in your, within your competition? Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, that's an excellent question. I, no, I, because we saw such good improvement with our pro traffic and sales last year, and in, in Q4, it was the highest we saw all year long. Um, and, and we think it was, you know, that improvement directly tied to launching our pro rewards program, uh, launching our pro market manager strategy, um, continuing to increase the number and the quality of pro events, and then obviously having all this new great product in, um, and the designers in particular really, you know, have given us some incredible feedback uh, on the new product assortment. We think those things are all still intact. And any deceleration in pro traffic and sales we saw, and it was still positive year over year in terms of sales growth for pros, but it certainly decelerated. We think the main factors there are really related to weather and systems. And, you know, weather's got to improve here. And I think we, we think it has, you know, to some extent at least. And, uh, and systems is getting better and better, but we're, you know, still got some things we need to work on. So, you know, once we get to that point where we're good, you know, we should, you know, get all those pros back. And I think those, those foundational elements for our pro strategy that we put in place last year should continue to, um, help propel that part of our business. Great. Thanks. Good luck. Thank you. Our next question comes from Anthony Chukumba with Loop Capital. Your line is open. 
Good morning, and thanks for taking my question. Um, so I just had a question on um, the decision to, to pull back a bit on advertising year over year, the $1 million that you mentioned. Um, I guess I'm just trying to understand um, the thought process there, um, you know, given the fact that, um, you know, traffic has been, or, you know, has been a challenge for quite some time. You know, just kind of what your thinking was there in terms of pulling back on that. Thanks. Hey, Anthony, it's Cabby. Good question. Uh, as our strategy continued to change from promotional and going back to our core customer and going back to the pro and our brand marketing efforts, it, it shifted strategy and where, where the buckets of spend fell. So what we did is, is in my remarks, we went after, you know, different medias, uh, high-end design magazines. We invested into um, some of the internal operations here to do the work ourselves, um, so photo studios and, and things like that. And saving some of that money uh, is something we felt was, was the best way when we knew everything that was going on in Q1 with the website, with the, the uh, ERP, with the pop-ins going in, with the new products arriving. It's, it was kind of a chaotic quarter for us. So we decided uh, as our strategy that that was – with intent, and um, I believe it, it, we wouldn't have gotten the best return on that investment through Q1. Okay, that's helpful. That makes sense. And then I, I guess I just want to understand, obviously you spent a lot of time talking about the weather and talking about, you know, the fact that the, the point of sale system was, was sort of slow and, and that negatively impacted sales, particularly with pros. I'm just trying to understand how did the ERP system, like how did that contribute to that? Like, in other words, like what – why were the ERP – how did the AR this, – the, this problems implementing the ERP, how did that affect other parts of your business? I'm just trying to make sure I completely understand that. Thank you. Well, uh, Anthony, our POS is, is a subcomponent of ERP. So it's a fully integrated system, including POS and all other aspects of our business. But the POS functionality was the place that we were having the most challenges as we flipped to the new system on January 1st. Got it. That, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, Anthony. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. Our next question comes from Peter Keith with Piper Jeffrey. Your line is open. Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to ask a strategic question um, just around, as you said, some of uh, maybe you lost some pro business in the quarter. So I guess it's interesting to me that the, the gross margin was exceptionally strong. In fact, looking back, it was the best gross margin you've reported in six years. And so why wasn't there a decision made to maybe give discounts to pros in order to retain that business? And, and, and thinking about this forward, uh, you know, you lose someone's business, it is hard to get them back. So it, is there a consideration that maybe you have to give, give discounts to get people to come back in and, and regain their trust? Hey, Peter, this is Cabby. Um, yes, I believe um, knowing that our new pro-loyalty program has positioned us very well to continue to give discounts and increase discounts to our best pro customers while also making other pros attain those discounts. Now, pros always are going to get discounts with the tile shop. They always have. But when we launched our new pro rewards program, it was more structured. And that, what that did was it, it, it enabled us to really fall into buckets, what pros deserve what discount, and I believe that has helped our gross margin and will continue to help our gross margin going forward. I guess, Gabby, with that structure, though, why not give someone an extra 5% when they're standing at the checkout for 15 minutes and getting frustrated? I, I just don't – I'm concerned that you're going to have trouble getting these people back in with, with marketing. Um, I think you have to give – I personally think you'll have to give them discount, further discounts to win them back. Where am I incorrect in that thinking? No, you're absolutely right, Peter. And our store managers and sales staff have the autonomy to do whatever it takes to make sure that pro is happy. Now, you can give them an extra 5%, 10% off, which we did in many cases, to make sure that they understood we knew that we were frustrating them at that point. But it's also, if you can give all the money away, it's not going to take care of that pro relationship. What we wanted to do was make sure they were they were taken care of at that point, but we did see uh, maybe some less frequent visits for the, the small items. If they knew we were suffering from a system issue at that point, they may have gone somewhere else to get, you know, a bag of Thinset or a bag of grout. So, but we believe they're, they're back um, as 
as we monitor our, our pro sales mix and our growth in that segment. But no, absolutely right. We made sure our pros, if they were in front of us and they were having problems, we did everything we could to make sure they were happy. I'm a big proponent of, you know, give them the sponge, give them the bucket, give them the 5% off, whatever it takes to make sure that they know we understand their frustration and they're going to come back. Okay. Thank you. And then, uh, I guess I'm still a little confused that maybe some of the comments that, that Kirk was making. So the, I guess the order uh, amounts that you have on the books, the, the, the pros have not come to pick those up uh, because of, of uh, the weather uh, challenges slash delays. It, in, in the quarter, am, am I interpreting those comments correctly? Yeah, that's right, Peter. That's our that's our best guess. I mean, okay. And it, we have heightened order banks, particularly in you know markets like uh, the Twin Cities here, Minneapolis, St. Paul, where we set a record for snow in March. And, I, that, and that's just our guess. That's got to be part of the factor. We've had some anecdotal feedback from many pros that you know their projects have been delayed, particularly in the cold weather markets like. Uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Chicago, Detroit, in particular. Okay, and then th does that? If, if you're saying you would have probably hit your guidance with if, if all of that had been collected, does that support a, a strong start here in, in April or a, you know a shift of sales into Q2? Well, we don't want to get into specifics on on, on you know April or Q2, but. Um, you know, again, I think a big part of it for us is going to be able to get our systems back to where they need to be. And if we can do that, then, uh, you know, and everything else cooperates, they, you know, uh, things we can't control largely, obviously. There's other things going on with macro, and, you know, we should be able to, you know, see some improvement. That's our goal for sure. Okay. And, and it, maybe just I'm going to ask this again from someone else, but seeing that improvement, when do you – do you think it's it's going to show up in Q2 where you're kind of back to a, a normalized positive comp, or, or do we have to wait until back half a year now for some of the marketing to kick in and, and the ERP issues to settle down? Peter, I just don't want to get into specifics about Q2. I mean, uh, you know, we're trying to um, deal with all the variables that we had in Q1, and, you know, our, certainly our goal internally is to get back to mid-single-digit comps. And, we're going to work very, very hard to do that as fast as we can. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. And our next question comes from Daniel Moore with CJS Securities. Your line is open. Thank you. Um, sorry to, to, to kind of pick at this. One last question as it relates to that open order book. Um, is there any penalties to the pros for canceling? I guess my question is how do you – you know, um, you mentioned it's your best guess, Kurt. How do you know that they didn't go somewhere else to fulfill those orders given some of the, um, you know, customer service challenges? Uh, Daniel, this is Cabby. Good question. There is no penalty for canceling an order, but our store managers and our sales associates are, are in tune with every order they have on the books. So there is constant communication and uh, about uh, – Timelines, deliveries, and the feedback we've gotten is that they are waiting. Uh, a lot of them have closed out, but a lot of them continue to sit. And as we have transitioned more and more to a pro business, we've seen larger individual orders that have skewed a store's open order bank. We're getting bigger, bigger orders, more commercial jobs that we've never seen uh, before. So. I think that has also had an impact to these large orders sitting is that they're big jobs. They're not just a, a, a residential home. So that's uh, that's part of the reason as well. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, and I'm showing no further questions. I'd like to turn the call back to Mr. Ken Cooper for closing remarks. Thanks for listening to our earnings conference call. We are looking forward to seeing many of you while we're on the road in May and June and then providing our next update in July. Thank you for your interest in Tile Shop, and have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating in today's conference. This concludes today's program. You may all disconnect. Everyone, have a great day.